will sing his love to me. When we think about standards, Christian principles, at the focus of it all, at the foundation of it all, it has to be God's love. Because if we're doing it just because it's a rule or just because this is what people think we should do, it'll never last, right? You know, you think about the little child who is told, you have to do this, you have to do this, and it's all the outward compliance. But as soon as those parents are gone, what happens? <laughs> Everything goes out the window. So when we come to these classes on Christian principles, it comes back to us, what's going to be at the foundation of our change? Is it just going to be because this is what is required of us? Or is it because this is what I know that God wants me to do in my life? So that's what I want us to come back to as we begin this journey together on music principles. And this is a big topic, a big topic, a controversial topic, a topic that comes close to our hearts. And... I remember when someone talked to me about the music that I listened to, and I was like, you're crazy. I didn't say that to them, but I thought it in my mind. It's like, you don't know what you're talking about. So these things can be hard, hard to hear, hard to understand even, but we're all on this journey. And so this week, I want to share with you the journey that God has brought me on in regards to music, and I hope you will continue to teach me and that he will guide you on your musical journey. So as we begin, let's kneel for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you this morning for waking us up, for bringing us here, for giving us the opportunity to come to this place to learn from you, to learn more about your truth, not only in regards to health and how to help the body physically, but more importantly, how to live our life in a way that pleases you, in a way that's best. And when that comes against our will, we ask that you will continue to work upon our hearts, that you will open our eyes and our ears, be our teacher now. We want you in this place. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. This is my first time, I think, teaching uh, in this six-month period. So it's a privilege to be here with you and to get to share um, more about music. It's one of my favorite topics. Who of you likes music? Do you like music? When I was young, I didn't realize how um, much I really liked music. I had music lessons as a child, and it was this, this thing of you have to practice, but you don't really love it. And as I got older, I discovered that I really loved music, even though I wasn't musical, but I really loved music. And in this whole journey, God has been uh, taking me on a deeper experience when it comes to music principles. I want to begin this morning with a story. This happened in 1985, and there was... Uh, an area in the Bering Sea, off the Bering Sea of the Soviet Union, where thousands of beluga whales, this is a beluga whale, if you didn't know, they were uh, congregating in this area, and uh, the whales arrived, it was in December, and under normal conditions, they would have uh, only existed in this area just a short time, relatively unnoticed, but something unusual happened, there was pack ice that drifted in, and it trapped the whales under the surface. Now, if you didn't know, whales need air to survive. They can't breathe underwater, so they have to come up to the surface 
in order to survive. And these whales be, were now trapped under the ice. Well, there were a few holes in the ice, and they would have to come up each one for air, but there's thousands in this area trapped under the ice. And so they had to wait their turn for air. Well, the wait got to be too long, and a number of them, uh, before too long, became exhausted. And since the whales couldn't escape from that area, they quickly consumed all the available food, and they began to starve to death. The situation was grave, and so the people who were in that area and they noticed what was happening, they said, what can we do? How can we save these whales? So uh, someone heard about it who had a big ship, and this ship was an icebreaker, and so they came to the area, and they took that big ship and they rammed into the ice and created a path for the whales. And you know what happened? Nothing. The whales were too weak to discover that there was a path to freedom. And so the people were like, how can we, what can we do? Like, now we have created a path for these whales, but how do you lead a whale? How do you tell them, hello, this is the way to freedom? Well, someone thought about music, and they, they remembered that animals respond to music. And so they played the radio for them. They, they turned on uh, a music station and they blasted uh, this jazz music across the, the airways. And you know what happened? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. And the people are like, what in the world are we going to do? And so someone said, let's change the station. So they changed the station to a classical station. They played that over the airways. And you know what happened? the whales followed the music to freedom. There are over 1,150 verses in the Bible that make reference to music. Do you think music is important to God? Do you think it's something that he likes, that he finds enjoyment in, that he is interested in? You know, when you, when you read the stories of heaven, heaven is music. <laughs> There's so much music in heaven. God himself sings, we're told. And if in the Bible, the, the word of life that we have, there's referenced over a thousand references to music, I think it's something that God is interested in. Obviously, it's important to him. And as you look at music, you recognize that music communicates a message. Even to those beluga whales, a message was being communicated. There's power in music. Science tells us that music affects plants. Did you know that? Music affects plants. There are vibrations in the sound of music uh, that music produces, and as the sound, at, uh, such, I'm sorry, vibrations such as sound and physical disturbances affect plant growth. Studies done by the Smithsonian and NASA show that mild vibrations increase uh, growth in plants, while harsher, stronger vibrations have a negative effect. It's really interesting when you look at some of these studies, how when you play certain types of music, how it affects the plants differently. So music affects plants. Music also affects academic performance. Do you want to do better in your academics? music will have an impact on that. Middle school and high school students who participated in instrumental music scored significantly higher than their non-band peers in standardized tests. University studies conducted in Georgia and Texas found significant correlations between the number of years of instrumental music instruction and academic achievement in math, science, and language arts. I don't know about you, but math was never my favorite subject, but maybe it would have been even less of a favorite subject if I hadn't studied more about music. Music majors are the most likely group of college grads to be admitted to medical school. There were physicians and biologists who studied the undergraduate majors of medical school applicants, 
And they found that 66% of those who were music majors who applied to medical school were admitted. And in comparison, 44% of biochemistry majors were admitted. Also a study of 7,500 university students revealed that music majors scored the highest reading scores among all majors, including English, biology, chemistry, and math. So if you want to do better in your academics, studying music helps. Music also affects healing. Music affects healing. Music can be used to relieve pain in patients. For example, surgery patients at the Cleveland Clinic that listened to recorded music saw a four times increase in post-surgical pain. Or decrease, sorry, decrease of uh, post-surgical pain. Music has also been shown to reduce the amount of anesthesia needed during operations. So if you're going to get an operation, you might want to play music. It'll help with that recovery. Music is also instrumental in the aging brain function. National Geographic magazine said that while listening to music is great for you, picking up an instrument and learning to play it can build new neural pathways that will benefit you in the future. While it's especially important in childhood, learning the guitar or piano later in life can still have huge cognitive benefits. It also explains that the increased cognitive function built by learning music can slow down brain decline later in life. So it doesn't matter what age you are, if you were to pick up an instrument and start to learn it, it's actually going to help your brain going to help your brain. You may never be able to play at Carnegie Hall, but it's going to help your brain stay young. Playing music uses both sides of your brain, so more of your mind is stimulated, and we all need more of that. Music also helps to tune your immune system. You know, we're living in times where the immune system is under attack. The type of music we listen to can actually help us build our immune system and fend off viruses. So negative music is We're going to get into that. McGill University in Montreal studied 400 research papers regarding the neurochemistry of music and found many benefits including a boosted immune system. The findings from the university included that music increase levels of immunoglobulin A that helps your body fend off viruses. It also boosts antibodies responsible for destroying bacteria that slips past your body's security systems. The research team also found that music can lower our cortisol levels that lead to stress, and we all know that stress is a killer. So music can help in that. Now music therapy also has helped people in their communication especially autistic children. A stroke patient who has lost the ability to speak after struggling to relearn normal speech patterns has had a breakthrough when they were taught to sing. So singing music can actually help with restoring the ability to speak. So music affects healing. Music can help us in our healing process. Music affects our mental well-being. Do you ever struggle with your mental well-being? Well, music can have an effect on that. Playing a musical instrument can reverse stress at the molecule level, according to studies conducted by Loma Linda University of Medicine. Music, making music can help reduce job burnout and improve your mood. So there was a group that uh, they went into uh, a company where the people were burned out. And they would create these sessions where they would come away from their work throughout the day and they would sing. They would sing together. And they actually discovered that this really helped the overall morale of the company and people were no longer feeling the weight of responsibility and the burnout of the job because they had those singing sessions, those music making sessions. So music affects our mental well-being. If you're feeling bogged down, 
maybe we should start a choir. Music affects us. There's power in music. Science tells us that. But the word of God also tells us that. And that's the most important thing. Because science can change, right? But God's word doesn't change. So I want us to look at a story in the Bible. If you have your Bibles, we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And in this chapter, we have a story in relation to music and how music affected someone. We're going to start with verse 14 of 1 Samuel chapter 16. Verse 14. And Dixon, can you read that for us? Okay, so we're talking about King Saul here, and I'm sure you're familiar with this story. So he he's troubled, and the Bible calls it an evil spirit. Um, He's very troubled, and so his servants come to him, and they tell him to do something, and that's in verse 16. We begin verse 16. So we're just going to go through. We're going to read up until verse 19. So we'll start with Sydney, and we'll just go back. 1 Samuel 16, 16. Okay, so they said what? Do what? Get, get a musician. He's going to play for you, and you're going to be well. Okay? So that's what they told him. Verse 17. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Verse 18. Macon. Jesse. Mm-hmm. Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Uh huh. Bethlehemite. Be- Good job. Who is skillful in playing a might, man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person. And the Lord is with him. Okay, and verse 19. And now we're going to skip to verse 23. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed in the word well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Okay, so. Saul sent for this musician. He came. He's troubled again with this, the Bible says, evil spirit. And what happened? Departed. Gone. Wow. Just from playing music. Music is powerful. There's power in music. We looked at how music helps with your mental well-being. Music helps with healing, academic performance, and it can even drive away the enemy. Music is powerful. But is it only a power for good, or can it also be a power for evil? Is music one of those things that's neutral? You know, that's how we approach uh, oftentimes this topic. You know, it's your preference, my preference. There's many flavors of music in the world today, you know, and there's these different terms that are thrown around, rock, jazz, classical, blues, pop, country. There's numerous terms to describe these varying flavors. And we can approach this as 
apple, orange, banana. You don't have to like an apple. It's okay. But what does God say? Is music only a power for good or can it be a power for evil? And where do we have to go for our answer? We have to go to the word of God. And I love when we get involved in true education, we start learning that there's not a topic that we can address in life that isn't addressed in here, some way, somehow. In our true education seminars, when we're working with young families and we talk about, okay, let's study space exploration. And we're like, okay, let's go to the Bible and there's space exploration, right? Spacecrafts in here, yes, you know? The angels fly swiftly, you know how, Gabriel in the Bible, um, it says he, Daniel prayed and he was there. That's space exploration, space travel. We're going to explore the universe. There's not a topic in here that we can't, um, that, that we are faced with life that we don't have in the word of God. Sometimes not the exact words, but the principles are there. And so here we have the topic of music. God's talked about it in the Bible over a thousand times. So what does he say? Does he talk about music in reference to evil or just good? So let's look. Before we go there, though, I want us to look at the Spirit of Prophecy reference. This is from Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, page 505. It says, Music is the idol which many professed Sabbath-keeping Christians worship. Music is the idol which many Sabbath-keeping Christians worship. So no wonder when we talk about some of these things, we get offended or defensive, right? I've been there. The first time someone said, what about your music? <laughs> You're crazy. I come from a conservative Christian background, raised in a good home listening to good music. Music is the idol which many profess Sabbath-keeping Christians worship. Satan has no objection to music if he can make that a channel through which to gain access to the minds of the youth. Is music enticing? Is music attractive? It is. It can be an attraction for good, but can it be an attraction for evil? Evil. It says right here, Satan has no objection to music if he can make that a channel through which to gain access to the minds of the youth. When turned to a good account, music is a blessing, but it is often made one of Satan's most attractive agencies to ensnare souls. One of Satan's most attractive agencies. When abused, it leads the unconsecrated to pride, vanity, and folly. When allowed to take the place of devotion and prayer, it is a terrible curse. So this, this quote here highlights a few things. It highlights the fact that music is an idol for many of God's people. We're told that Satan uses music to access the minds of God's followers and that it is one of the mo his most attractive snares. So we want to look at is how efficient of a snare this can be. How efficient has Satan been in using music as a snare throughout history? So let's turn to Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. Numbers chapter 22, verses 1 through 4. And this time we're going to start in the very back with our sister, in the very far back corner, and then we're going to go through. You don't have it? Maybe someone can share with her? No? You don't want to? Okay. Okay. Stephanie, verse 1.
verse 4, uh, Nesiah. Okay, great. So here we, we find the children of Israel, right? They're encamped in the wilderness. And the surrounding nations, how are they feeling? They're what? Threatened. They're threatened, right? Because God is blessing this people. Mm-hmm. And so the surrounding nations, they look at the, this camp and they go, oh, no, this is not good. They're at the height, Israel is at the height of their experience, so to speak. God's blessing them. God's protecting them. God is leading them. Yes, they're making some mistakes, but they're coming back around. God's sustaining grace is upon them, and the surrounding nations are unable to do anything. Let's pick up verse uh, chapter 25. Uh, chapter 25, verses 1 through 3. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harvest fruit with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of the Nebra. That's a very different picture, right? Just a few chapters before, they could not curse Israel. When um, Balaam tried to curse, only blessings came out of his mouth. Now, a few chapters later, they're worshiping Baal. What happened? What happened? How did the spirituality of Israel just go boom like that? A few chapters later. In First Spirit of Prophecy, page 326, it says, Balaam knew that the prosperity of Israel depended upon their observance of the law of God, and that there was no way to bring a curse upon them but by seducing them to transgression. He counseled Balak to proclaim an idolatrous feast in honor of their idol gods, and he would persuade the Israelites to attend, that they might be delighted with the music, and then the most beautiful Midianitish women should entice the Israelites to transgress the law of God and corrupt themselves and also influence them to offer sacrifice to idols. This satanic counsel succeeded too well. So notice the progression of events just before the entrance to Canaan. You have someone who comes who appears to be a friend, friendly influence. And they, this, this man persuaded them to attend a gathering that was not honoring God. And they came, you know, because the, this friend invited them. And as they're there, it says what? They are delighted with the music. So their senses now become dull with the music. And then they see these beautiful women. And they're very friendly. And they're enticed to transgress the law of God. And this satanic council worked too well. Numbers 25, 5 through 8. Numbers chapter 25, verses 5 through 8. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every man, every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. 
And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So something happened throughout the camp. The, there was a plague that went out, right? And the people recognized that they have departed from God. And Moses says, we have to take care of this right here. And in the midst of all this thing that's happening, one of the Israelites bring into the camp in the broad daylight in front of everyone, a Midianitish woman, and takes her into his tent. Verse 7, and when Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. I want us to look at this story. As the narrative continues, we see that this man of Israel brings this woman into his tent. A man, and then the man of God, Phineas, slays them both in the very act of fornication. And from 1 Corinthians 6.16, we see we understand that these two individuals became one flesh, one body. And when they were slain, that, in that very moment, the plague was stayed. The plague stopped. Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25, verses 14 to 15. Macon, can you read verse 14 for us? Israelite. Why are these names mentioned? You know, they're not mentioned any other time in the Bible. Those specific names, they were killed. Why are their names mentioned? They were children of the leaders. They were children of the leaders. But why specifically? Couldn't it just say, you know, the leader's children? Why are their names listed? Have you ever looked up the meaning of names? That's really interesting. It's a very interesting study. When you're going through in um, the Bible, a lot of those begats, begat so-and-so, you know, and all these names. If you look up some of those meanings of those names, you, you're like, this message opens up. This one time, just as a little side note, I went through all the verses in the Bible for my birthday. So I was born in April, so I would look for chapter 4. And then I was born on the 17th, so verse 17. So I went through the whole Bible, and I wouldn't go from one verse to the next until I saw the message that God had for me. All right, so I got to uh, the book in the Bible that was talking about so-and-so be at so-and-so, and I'm like, okay, God, <laughs> what's the message you have for me? So then I looked up the meaning of those names, and it was so powerful. I, do I didn't bring the, the writing here, so I don't remember the exact phrase, but there was a message even in that. I, I don't know. Could be. 
When you look up in the Strong's Concordance, the, the meaning of these two names, it's very interesting. Zimri, that Israelite, means my music, musical. And Cosby, the Midianitish lady, her name means false, my lie. Isn't that so interesting? We're talking about music principles here. We see a story of how music enticed the Israelites, delighted their senses, confused their mind, led them into idolatry. It was one of the steps that Satan used to engross the mind to lead them into sin. And the very names of the individuals that are listed by name in this story mean my music false my lie so could it be that the meaning the illustration of phineas killing these two individuals in the very act that they became one that it's a lesson an illustration of how when music becomes false when you have a musical lie, that that's the very peak of fornication. And the, when those two are cut off, destroyed, severed, that's when the apostasy can be cut off. False music was highlighted as the chief attribute of Israel's apostasy. God's a musical God. And we, as a people, are musical people. And could it be, too, that we who are on the borders of the promised land, the heavenly Canaan, have embraced a lie in false music? Numbers 25, 16 to 18. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Vex the Midianites and smite them, for they vex you with their wiles, wherewith they have beguiled you in the matter of Peor, and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a prince of Midian, their sister, which was slain in the day of the plague for Peor's sake. They were beguiled with the music. When we talk about music principles, when we talk about these different Christian standards, many times how we approach these things is in sincerity. The things we're doing, it's not, yes, I know this is bad and then I'm going to do it anyway, you know? We're sincere in how we sing, what we perform, what we listen to, how we dress, how we eat. There's sincerity there. But sincerity doesn't negate the negative effects of those things. We're told in the Spirit of Prophecy, Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 56, faith in a lie will not have a sanctifying influence upon the life or character. No error is truth or can be made truth by repetition or by faith in it. Sincerity will never save a soul from the consequences of believing an error. Without sincerity, there is no true religion. So sincerity is good, right? We must be sincere. But sincerity in a false religion will never save a man. I may be perfectly sincere in following a wrong road, but that will not make it the right road, or bring me to the place I wished to reach. The Lord does not want us to have a blind credulity and call that the faith that sanctifies. The truth is the principle that sanctifies, and therefore it becomes us to know what is truth. What is truth? And I hope that's why we're here. What is truth? It's not all the things that I've been taught or everything that I hear, even here. But this is to lead us to seek what is truth. I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything. 
but I want to know what is true. And as we come to these topics and we hear different things that maybe go against what we have embraced our, in our life, will it lead us once again to seek what is truth? We must compare spiritual things with spiritual. We must prove all things, but hold fast only that which is good, that which bears the divine credentials, which lays before us the true motives and principles, which should prompt us to action. Fa uh, error is never harmless. We think, you know, it's not that bad. Eating between meals or or listening to a certain song, it's not that bad. But air is never harmless. It never sanctifies, but always brings confusion and dissension. It is always dangerous. As we learn these new truths, as we learn these things, you know, it's easy to just say, hmm, that's an interesting idea. But let it lead us to go back and say, God, what is truth? Teach me. Help me to have a balanced perspective. Help me to really understand what pleases you. When we think about this quote in reference to music, we have to recognize that this is an important topic, that understanding true godly music must be prominent in our lives. We're told the sincerity would not save us from the consequences of that which is not of heavenly origin. There's another story in reference to music, and I'm just going to summarize it. I'm sure you're familiar, but in Daniel chapter 3, it talks about this time when the golden image is raised up. Nebuchadnezzar brings that image on the plains in Babylon, and the plains of Dura in Babylon, in the province of Babylon. And he says, okay, everyone, you're gathered here. When you hear the music, then I want you to bow down. Why did he use music? Why? Why? Because music communicates a message. Music, right, it, it communicates a message. It goes past our frontal lobe. It goes deep. And that's, too, one reason when we touch on music, it cuts us deep, when we recognize that maybe there's something that we need to give up. Force is the last resort of every false religion. At first, it tries attraction. Let's play that music. Let's entice those Israelites. Let's delight their senses. At first, it tries attraction, as the king of Babylon tried the power of music and outward show. If these attractions, invented by men inspired by Satan, failed to make men worship the image, the hungry flames of the furnace were ready to consume, excuse me, consume them. So it will be now. Could it be that the music that we're, you're, we're used to accepting in our lives, or the music that we've heard even in our churches, is something that Satan is using to attract us, to, to get us to the place where you don't, it's not that important what you stand on, what you really believe. Music communicates a message. Could it be that it's setting us up to bow down and worship the image? We have looked at the two examples in the Bible of how music led individuals into idolatry. And we're told, and I'm not going to take the time to read these because we're almost out of time, but we're told that these same things will come into our churches in the last days to confuse our senses. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. How? By the music that is introduced. 
This is the invention of Satan to cover up his ingenious methods. All should guard the senses, lest Satan gain victory over them, for these are the avenues of the soul. Those who would not fall a prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. What are the avenues of the soul? One of them is, right, our ears. The heart must be faithfully sentineled, or evils without will awaken evils within. The heart is corrupt. When we first started learning about music principles, my mom said, you know, that music doesn't touch me the same way. It's true, it doesn't. Because our hearts naturally gravitate to that which is not pure and holy. But we can have new hearts, a converted taste, and that's what God wants to teach us. Music, when not abused, is a great blessing, but when put to a wrong use, it is a terrible curse. Satan is leading the young captive. Oh, what can I say to lead them to break his power of infatuation? You know, it's so interesting because we looked at the story of the children of Israel being enticed with music and women. And this word infatuation is often used in reference to individuals getting infatuated with each other. Music and relationships. Could it be that those two things are Satan's most successful arts in ensnaring our souls? He is a skillful charmer, luring them on to perdition. So what does this quote tell us just in closing? Music is a great blessing when not abused. But music is a terrible curse when put to a wrong use. So there's music that is good and there's music that is bad. Satan uses music to lead people captive. Bad music has the power of infatuation. And Satan is a skillful charmer and knows how to bring in subtle things in music to lure us on to perdition. You know, you ha- might have gone through many music seminar presentations. And in this, this week that we're going to talk about music principles, we're not going to look at some of those blatant things, you know, the really wild, crazy stuff that everyone knows. I want us to look at the more subtle things, the things that could be in my music or your music. The things that Satan uses as his skillful charm to lure us on into his path. There's a lot we need to learn in regards to this musical journey. But that's what it is. It's a journey. And in this journey, we have to ask the most important question, is this the way of the Lord? Proverbs, or Ephesians rather, 5.10 says, Prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. Not what is acceptable to me and my desires, not what is acceptable to my church, not what is acceptable to my family, my friends, but what is acceptable to God. And when we think about Christian principles, Christian standards, that's the foundation. I will sing of Jesus' love. Jesus' love. And that's why I make changes in my life. And when that's at our focus, when God, we proved what is acceptable to him, then we can rest assured that we are in a safe, path. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God of music and you want to also delight our senses and encourage us on this journey of life. So I pray that as we go from this place, that you will continue to be our teacher, that we will prove what is acceptable to you. We don't want to be joined to false music, to things that corrupt, the things that are preparing our hearts to bow down to the image of the beast. We want to be sealed for eternity. And so we ask you to continue.